On this Friday night, a new crisis at another Ontario care home. The coronavirus infects the facility, leaving workers fed up and residents abandoned. Everyone knew it could happen, and then, then when it did, it was, it was, it was quite um, gut-wrenching. The growing challenges for all these facilities across Canada. Canada's political leaders prepare for post-pandemic life. We need eventually to restart the economy. And new questions about police enforcing quarantines. A loose strategy with no lockdown. And if you can stay on this level, I think we are really going in the right direction. Sweden's controversial COVID-19 plan. And no longer in the clear. The fresh fears for coronavirus patients who thought they recovered. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Lots of developments to get to on this Friday, but we begin with the devastating impact of this pandemic on Canada's most vulnerable people. Across the country, hundreds of long-term care facilities have been hit by outbreaks. One home for people with disabilities in Ontario says it's in crisis mode after declaring an outbreak. Staff reportedly walked off the job last night after hearing workers and residents had tested positive. Now the home is struggling to feed and care for the people who live there. It's unfair to our, you know, to our residents to not get the care they need right now. We're, we are caring for them and just to be clear, everyone is in their rooms and we are, we are looking after them. But it is, we need more. We can't, it's not sustainable what we're doing. Care homes across Canada are desperate for staff during the COVID-19 outbreak. There was a severe shortage of workers even before the coronavirus hit. And those who are working in these facilities face a grim battle. While trying to protect the residents from infection, they're doing their best to save themselves. And hundreds of Canadian families are dealing with their own dilemma. Take their loved ones out of care homes or leave them inside and hope they'll be spared. Ross Lord has our top story tonight. After COVID-19 broke out at this Markham, Ontario home for disabled adults, some unionized staff walked off the job. Managers are scrambling to find replacements, so the home's 42 residents aren't abandoned. A number of residents and staff tested positive for the virus, causing panic. Once we shared it was positive, um, we had staff in the room decide they couldn't stay. And ultimately last night um, was a very sickening feeling because we have 42, uh, the most vulnerable. I can't impress upon you how vulnerable our, our residents are. Markham's mayor has made a public plea for anyone who can provide personal protective equipment so the outbreak doesn't become even worse. The Ontario government is offering what assurances it can over an uncontrollable situation. Well, we'll make sure we get proper staff uh, in there supporting the, the residents, but I'll pass this over to the Minister of Health. We need to make sure that any of them exhibiting uh, COVID-19 symptoms are going to be properly cared for. We're going to need to put them into self-isolation and make sure that they get the care that they expect and deserve. Outbreaks in care homes account for the majority of COVID-related deaths in BC and roughly half of all deaths from the virus in Ontario and Quebec, leaving families trying to protect their loved ones. I've lost one parent to, to COVID-19 as it is. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it when it comes. The Prime Minister continues to offer support to health care workers who are risking their own lives and increasingly becoming infected. But we also need them to know that we have their back as they don their protective gear, as they go into battle against this virus for the rest of us. We need to make sure they're getting all the support they need because they are the ones that are going to save Canadians. The union that represents many nursing home workers is not convinced. Well, I want to believe that, uh, but what we're seeing across the country is uh, that workers are being exposed. The nursing home industry hopes measures like mandatory masking of residents and staff will limit the virus. The primary objective, obviously, was to keep the disease out of the homes and, and out of, out of our, our care facilities. But once it's in, we have to take all measures then to manage it down. Back in Markham, emergency staffing is in place. The home's owner, Participation House, says it's doing everything it can to prevent further spread of the virus. Ross Lord. Global News. In Canada, more than 560 people have died of COVID-19, and many of them are linked to long-term care facilities. 
Here's a look at the numbers today. Almost 1,400 new cases have been reported across the country. Quebec saw the biggest jump, 765 new cases. Ontario's numbers are also going up. It reported 478 new cases today, sending the province's total surging past 6,000. Overall in Canada, there are now more than 22,000 confirmed cases. The number of confirmed cases is growing inside federal prisons. At one in B.C., a lockdown is in place after at least 23 inmates tested positive. The Mission Institution tested the inmates after they developed flu-like symptoms. The facility is still waiting on test results from more than a dozen other inmates. At least three prison guards have also tested positive. The medium security prison has the highest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases at a federal facility. More than 50 cases have been confirmed at prisons across Canada. Canada's public health officer is sending a warning to Canadians during this Easter long weekend. She says now is not the time to give up physical distancing. This year, it's got to be all about the staycation for the nation. The choice of where to be, home in your bubble, with your existing household members only, has never been clearer. There is no choice but to plank the curve, then crush it. The Prime Minister has warned life won't get back to normal anytime soon. But as Michael Couture explains, some leaders at the provincial level are sounding more optimistic, even talking about the path to recovery. We need eventually to restart the economy and give hope to the population. On the eve of Easter, Quebec's Premier is already talking about resurrecting his province's economy, claiming Quebec is approaching the peak of the pandemic. François Legault isn't ruling out bringing back schools by May 4th because everyone is following health recommendations, even himself. We can be proud of ourselves. We're doing everything we can. <coughs> Pardon. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau agrees with Legault. However, he believes easing some of the health measures is months, not weeks away. Adding projections show the end of the first wave of COVID-19 will come in the summer. At that point, we will be able to talk about loosening up some of the rules that are in place, uh, looking at particular sectors where uh, people can go back to work. Legislation to keep people on payrolls is expected to pass tomorrow during a special sitting of both the House of Commons and Senate. The wage subsidy program is part of the largest economic measures Canada has seen since World War II. Other historic moves being considered include using the sweeping Emergencies Act to allow the federal government to control movement of people and redirect medical supplies to hotspots. While it was discussed during the weekly conference call with premiers, it might not be necessary. We are seeing that the collaboration, the partnership uh, among provinces and territories and the way we're moving forward on this uh, means that we might not ever have to use the Emergencies Act and that would be our preference. Ontario Premier Doug Ford doesn't think the act is needed, particularly to enforce stricter physical distancing, even though the Mayor of Toronto says officers are patrolling parks this long weekend. Let's try to avoid getting a fine. Uh, everyone knows what we need to do and we're just asking people to make sure that they stay home with their loved ones. And Mike, police will also be out enforcing an order under the Quarantine Act, which requires everyone arriving in Canada to stay home for 14 days. How are they planning to do this? Well, Robin, they're dispatching the RCMP. Now, if public health officials can't reach someone who's supposed to be in self-isolation or quarantine by phone, text or email, you could have the Mounties show up at your home. Failing to comply with a quarantine order could mean a million dollar fine. And if it's believed you've put others at risk by being out and about, the maximum jail time is three years. It's a clear sign that they want people to take this seriously, Robin. Mike Lecouture in Ottawa. Thanks, Mike. In the United States, government documents show there is no way the lockdown is close to ending. Yesterday alone, nearly 1,900 people died. Tonight, there are more than 480,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. And more than 18,000 people are dead. But as Jackson Prosco reports, the president insists the economy will be up and running by May. In New York, there's no end to the sadness. Bodies are taken to temporary morgues outside hospitals that are filled to capacity. 
after another day with an unthinkably high number of deaths and more mixed news. To use an overused term, we are cautiously optimistic that we are slowing the infection rate. That's what the numbers say. There were nearly 10,000 new cases reported in the state in 24 hours. But hospitalizations have leveled off. And for the first time in weeks, more people were discharged from the ICU than admitted to it. It's really about the encouraging signs that we see. But as encouraging as they are, we have not reached the peak. Across the U.S., there's still an alarming surge in case numbers in new hotspots. New Jersey and Pennsylvania are seeing their numbers rise dramatically, raising deep uncertainty about when life could return to normal in the U.S. When we decide at a proper time when we're going to be relaxing some of the restrictions, there's no doubt you're going to see cases. I would be so surprised if we did not. President Donald Trump has suggested he'd like the economy to restart by May. But U.S. government projections obtained by the New York Times suggest fatalities would spike if stay-at-home orders were lifted after just 30 days. There remains a shortage of COVID-19 testing needed to allow a return to regular life. We are doing tremendous testing, but you'll know. You're going to know before anybody because you're going to see nobody's getting sick anymore. It will be gone and it won't be that much longer. That requires getting the crisis under control. In a sick twist of irony, some of America's private hospitals have started to lay off doctors and nurses in the middle of the pandemic, blaming losses suffered after elective surgeries were canceled to make room for coronavirus patients. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. An unprecedented Good Friday Mass. Coming up, how the Pope was forced to mark the occasion. Plus, another devastating diagnosis for some coronavirus patients. There was another grim pandemic milestone today. The number of deaths worldwide from COVID-19 has now passed 100,000. Cases are also climbing with more than 1.6 million infected. Italy still has the highest number of fatalities. More than 18,000 people have died in that country. Now, there are signs tonight that Italy and Spain have passed the peak of the pandemic, but it's a very different story in the UK and France which are now witnessing their worst waves of COVID-19 since the virus hit. Redmond Shannon reports. Politely policing a pandemic, a London officer asks people to go home if they are not visibly exercising. Enforcing the rules here is getting more difficult as the spring weather improves, even as the death toll soars. Of those who've contracted the virus, 8,958 have sadly died an increase of 980 since yesterday. In Ireland, the national lockdown has been extended until May 5th and police are out to block any Easter getaway plans. I can reiterate, a journey to a holiday home is not an essential journey. We will be able to turn you back. No. Police in France are using humour to convince people to stay home. The message, the couch should be as far as you go this weekend. In Germany, the death rate among those infected is distinctly lower than in other parts of Europe. This group of worshippers gathered for a special drive-in Good Friday Mass, praying for the victims and their families. And in the Vatican, a Good Friday Mass like no other. Pope Francis addressing an almost empty St. Peter's Basilica. Italy remains the country worst affected by the pandemic. This year, only the Pope was permitted to kiss the crucifix. A solemn moment and another reminder of how this crisis has touched almost every aspect of life. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Still ahead, comparing the pandemic plans in two countries where one isn't in lockdown. Watching Global National. Here in Canada and around the world, governments are urging their citizens to stay home. But there is one country that's taking a very different approach to COVID 19. Restaurants, schools, and playgrounds remain open in Sweden. That strategy is controversial, and as Eric Sorensen explains, it's now being tested. Is there another way? 
While countries the world over have shut down, Sweden has kept its schools open and its businesses. People are keeping a distance, but they are out. Look at the street, says this couple. People are out and about and happy. Swedes have been told to look out for the elderly, stay at home if you're sick, and work at home if you can. Sweden's chief epidemiologist. We are going out with that message very, very clearly, and it has also had quite an impact if you look at the streets in Stockholm. But Sweden has not ordered a lockdown. This hairdresser was as busy as ever. I hope, she says, they don't do what they've done in Denmark. Denmark is linked by bridge to Sweden. It was among the first European countries to close its borders and its schools. A bit like a nightmare. Business for this Danish hairdresser and throughout Copenhagen vanished, though he supports the strong measures. We trust like the, the government and we believe in that and we think actually they're doing a, a good job. Who is doing a good job? That's the question all countries are asking. For Sweden and Denmark, the number of COVID-19 deaths was fairly equivalent at first, but then Sweden saw a surge in April. Here in Canada, the pandemic came a little bit later, but again, the numbers were about the same in the beginning, but then that unsettling increase in Sweden far outpaced the number of deaths in this country. Canada is more like the Danish model. People went home, and epidemiologists here insist half measures won't work. The only way that we're going to continue to slow down the spread of the virus is all of us kind of have to put it together and all of us have to do our part. There is now nervousness in Sweden. COVID-19. The king, in a rare address, suggested Swedes stay home this Easter. And hundreds of academics signed a letter to government calling for tougher measures. It's extreme measurements that are, need to be taken uh, before you can get control over this virus. But Sweden is not changing course yet. Of course we're suffering. Everybody in the world is suffering right now. But uh, it's working. And the Swedish healthcare is delivering results just as good as they ever done. And now Denmark is looking to ease up and reopen its schools right after Easter. Det bliver måske i virkeligheden lidt. It's a bit like walking a tightrope, says the Danish Prime Minister, one cautious step at a time. Can we fail? As countries like Canada look ahead, there may be simple changes or hard lessons to learn from Scandinavia. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. South Korea says 91 people who recovered from COVID-19 have again tested positive. The director of the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention believes the virus may have been reactivated rather than patients being reinfected. This heightens fears of a potential second wave. Doctors around the world are hopeful people will build an immunity to COVID-19 after recovering. Congo has at least two cases of COVID-19, but now it has even more to worry about. The World Health Organization says a new case of the Ebola virus has been confirmed in eastern Congo. The news comes just three days before the country was expected to declare an end to that outbreak. The new case was confirmed in Beni, the epicenter of the second deadliest Ebola outbreak in history. The country had gone more than 40 days without a case. Since August of 2018, more than 2,000 people have died from Ebola. Should they stay or should they go? Up next, why some Canadians are choosing not to come home. Many families within Canada will be spending this holiday weekend apart. But there is an even greater distance for those who are overseas. The government says 367,000 Canadians are out of the country right now. Global Affairs reports it fielded more than 1,400 phone calls and over 1,500 emails on Wednesday alone from Canadians wanting to return. But as Mike Drillet reports, some believe staying put is the safest choice. Alexis Rancier didn't debate long about returning to Canada once COVID-19 started to spread. She lives happily with her boyfriend in England. And as an occupational therapist at a large hospital, she's on the front lines every day. I really do miss my family, which was hard for me to make the decision. But um, in the long run, it'd be the better choice for me to just stay and help where I can. There are over 350,000 Canadians living or traveling abroad right now. While the lure of family is strong, most are staying where they're at. Kevin Kaners has built a life in Germany, a country considered ahead of the curve in dealing with the pandemic. Far better, he believes, than Canada. I did still feel it was safer and more comfortable to, to stay here than coming back home to Canada. That sentiment was echoed again and again with the Canadians we spoke with. 
Leora Wolfman points to her friends in Toronto who are still going to parties. So it's just not looking effective or safe. In Austria, where she's living on a skilled immigrant visa, small businesses and restaurants are preparing to reopen after two very strict months. It's hard not being able to see my friends. I haven't seen my, my boyfriend in almost a month, actually. Justine Beaulieu was on a life-changing trip through the Pacific Rim when Canada was getting familiar with the terms isolation and social distancing. Complicating matters for her in Cambodia is the political situation. Martial law could be declared any day, which she hopes won't affect her since she's found work on a remote island. There's a lot of fear of foreigners now. Um, bars and restaurants won't let foreigners in. It's mandatory for you to wear a mask in public in the big cities. For now, she'll watch the Cambodian situation unfold and stay in paradise while waiting for COVID-19 to clear up back home. And it's crazy the thought of being stranded out, you know, out here, out anywhere for, for up to a year. Considering the isolation alternative in Canada, she's not in a bad place. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Robin Gill. As we keep you informed about COVID-19, Donna Friesen will be hosting a special program on Sunday evenings. It's called Coronavirus, The New Reality, and it starts this Sunday at 7 p.m. Tonight, we leave you with a poignant moment at Notre Dame Cathedral in France. Still under construction from last year's fire, the Archbishop held a small Good Friday service. Only seven priests were allowed to join. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you back here tomorrow. Good night.